So I uh, want to say thanks so much for worshiping with us today. And uh, man, as the Holy Spirit ministers to your heart, just know this. He's doing that for a reason. One, to encourage you in your own faith. But two, so that you'll take what he's doing and you'll share it with the world that needs to know. So you guys, this is just the precursor to the game, man. This is just the warm-up right here, man. We're going to get filled up so we can go pour ourselves out. And you guys are in, a tr- in for a treat. Man, last night was awesome. This morning's been awesome. Hey, we are honored to have a uh, special guest with us. Who, uh, And this is what makes him special. One, God made him this way. But two, Matthew Hunt uh, grew up in Highland Park Community Church. And uh, there you go. And he said it before you said it, which makes it so funny. He's like... It is going to freak people out that you're giving me a microphone because when I left, they were horrified. (laughs) But you're going to see the power of Jesus Christ and his spirit at work and the difference that it can make. And I could go on and I I could go on and on and on, but that's not my job. So please give a warm Wyoming welcome to my friend, Matthew Hunt. All right. He's a good-looking dude, isn't he? Hey, I can't help it. He used to. He goes, I can't help it. Hey, man, he's fought for our country, but he's a big, big, big-time warrior for Jesus Christ. Go get Amen. him. Amen. Hey, it is awesome to be here. Now, I, let me just say this. I've been in, in crowds before where guest speaker get up there and be like, you know, there's something really special about being in this place, and you guys are special to me, and you know, all that jazz, you know. We've all heard it, and most people are like, he loves us. He really loves us, you know. Uh, and I'm the guy in the back going, Whatever. He says that to everybody. So anyways, with that being said, it's really good to be here. I love you guys. <laughs> it's awesome. I don't say that to everybody. Uh, and this is unique for me. Uh, I've, you know, I have the, the uh, pleasure of preaching the good news all over the place. And that is awesome, man. And, and it's a charge that not just me, but many people in here said, what? Yeah. <laughs> It's true. It has happened. God's good. I do not get the opportunity to do that where I grew up. This is pretty cool because there's a lot of people out there right now still going, I'm just struggling. Don't, don't blame you. Yes, the security knows I'm on the stage. It's okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's true. But some people, it'll, it'll be hard to believe, but I believe God changes people. Do you? Amen. And I believe that that can be a ministry, a testimony. Amen. Do you? Amen. So I, I, I do want to get into it pretty quick because for sake of time, any of you there again that know me know that I can talk to a wall, have a full conversation, and even get a great response. So um, if you let me, I would hold you here for two hours, but that's not going to happen. i got a plane to catch anyway. So here we go. Uh, but I do want to take just a minute. Uh, to thank all of you for coming out, and I, it's been really good to see some faces I've not seen for years. It has truly blessed my heart. Uh, Jones family, I love you guys, man. It, anyways, you guys are awesome. I love you. I just, they've known me since I was a little guy, and I have to give them some credit because they've put up with a lot. <laughs> so uh, I think your son was a bad influence on me. Pretty, pretty sure, yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure it's their fault, not mine. No. Uh, but anyways, I do, I, I'm going to get to it. I do want to rec- recognize one more person, and he's probably going to be really mad at for this, but I, it's okay. Yeah, Tom, you know it's coming. Yeah. Um, I had uh, the distinct honor of working with Tom Rudkin for years when I was here. Uh, now, I say this. It's very important. I want you guys to hear me. I'm going to say something, and I do not say it uh, to bolster up anyone uh, and to lift anyone up, because the only person I'll ever lift up is Lord Jesus Christ, who's done all for us, okay? But I do believe it's important, because a lot of times in our path, we don't get the opportunity. We sow seed, and sometimes it's watered, and, and it's harvested, and we never really see that. Every now and then, though, the Lord will give us a glimpse of how he's faithful if we just do our part. And I hope I can be an example of that to you, Tom. Uh, I know he's here. Hey, there he is. I see him. He's like, so, uh, but anyways, uh, I had the opportunity to work for Tom. I own a construction company in Florida. It was definitely blessed by God. It blew up way quicker than anything I or my partner would have ever imagined. It is up and operating very well, even without me there now. Um, and, and I owe a lot of that to the foundation this man laid. But more so than anything, I run a company that is a moral, ethical company. We do things the right way. Uh, we are not a ministry. We are a company, but I will minister to my employees through the company. Uh, I do, thank, come on, give it up. Hey, we need more employers like that, okay? 
Uh, but, and it's not to lift Tom up, but I, I still refer today in my company to a lot of things I remember from Tom, who was more of a father figure to me at that time than my own father. Therefore, Tom, thank you. It's uh, my distinct honor to be able to say thank you. Uh, that's why this time it's much more special because I don't get to do that. And then to my family, my mother, man, God bless you. <laughs> I think of it and I'm like, how did you do that? I'm not the only one. I have a brother and he's just as bad. Or was. Was. Praise God we both serve God now. Uh, but getting right into it. Pastor Mike, thank you for letting me come here today as well. All right. Give you a little background history. As I joined in 1997, I joined the Army Reserves right here on that one road. Poison Spider, I remembered it this time, uh, in 1997. And I ultimately transferred to another unit in Florida in whenever I moved to Florida. But uh, anyway, so I moved there. I got uh, into a, a position where I had the distinct honor and was given the opportunity to join up the 3rd Battalion, 20th Special Forces Group, Airborne, uh, which I don't ever recommend, ever. Uh, with that, real quick, I want to pause right there and say, if you're a veteran in the room, please stand up. I want to honor you for this Veterans Day weekend. That holds weight. Give it up. Give it up for our guys, man. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you. I'm going to tell you guys, listen, just stay standing for a minute. Whether, whether you all served in combat or you did your time three years and got out, it's irrelevant. Every one of us put our hand to a piece of paper that said, I will if I have to. So thank you. You can be seated. Thank you for your service. I enjoy telling other veterans that. It's fun. Uh, with that being said, I had the distinct honor to be a member of the 3rd Battalion, 20th Special Forces Group, Airborne. Uh, with that, is there any paratroopers in here? Airborne paratroopers? No? Yes. Any more? You're the first one. I ask every week, and I'm like, everyone else is smarter than us. They're like, why would I jump out of an airplane? You don't understand. It's not perfectly good. It's the military, okay? <laughs> Moving right along, uh, I was in that, that company. I was assigned to what they call an ODA, Operational Detachment Alpha. It's a really fancy way to say a Green Beret team. Um, I went through the 3rd Battalion Support Company, was attached to this team and assigned to this team. Uh, for combat operations support. So it was quite interesting. I really didn't know what I was getting into. Um, I, there's a lot of detail I can get to for sake of time. I'm going to skip right to a certain event, a certain day. Now, I'm going to get into this, and I'm going to tell, uh, give you an account of an, a true event that happened. And as I do this, I, I, I want you guys to, to listen with your ears and your hearts. I want to paint a picture. I want you to feel as much as you can feel, hear as much as you can hear, and try to imagine the smells and the sounds and the feelings of this event as we go forward. Can you do that? Okay. October 24, 2006, me and my team were on a routine combat mission in the northeastern provinces up by the Iran border in Iraq. And the events of the day that happened in the morning, I don't have time to get in detail, but unfortunately, um, they were not good. We're in positions and doing things that were just hard for anyone to do. I don't have time to do that, but what I can tell you is it would make a person think. It makes a person hurt. And so my job for the Special Forces, generally most of the time, for the better part of the time, was I was the gunner. I would sit up in the truck, stand up, my body, upper body of the truck with the gun, and my job was to be... Uh, to engage the enemy directly initially to provide cover fire, to shoot anything that moves so my team can dismount and re-engage. You can imagine it wasn't a very good job. There was times you had to think quick and you question your choices even. You make mistakes. Okay. <laughs> uh, the mission that started was uh, uh, started rough, and as we were, we were leaving there, my buddy Dan could recognize that on my face and my composure, I was not doing well based on the events that had happened that morning. And, and he looked up to me. He said, hey, Sarge, let me get some trigger time. You can have the trigger. I'm done. And so I said, just let me drive. I just want to drive. Let me drive. And so we get in the truck, and I'm driving. And the whole time we're driving, I'm just recounting events. And I'm asking myself the question. And I'm, I'm thinking, did I do the right thing? Was there a different way? How did I... How did 
a kid from Wyoming find myself in this position? I thought that. I had that exact same thought. As I was driving, I remember, I can see it. Man, I could tell you where the rocks were at right now. We were going down this dusty highway. The average temperature of where we were at was anywhere on the cold days from 120. I do have a picture to prove. No one would believe me. It was 140-something degrees one day. We would wear 80 pounds of gear, and we would fight through uh, running and shooting, and it was just unimaginable at the time. We were driving back, and inside those metal trucks, you can imagine if 100 and, let's see if it was 120 degrees, the inside of the truck becomes much more. And so we were driving, and I remember sweating and thinking, my gosh, we can make it, we can make it. The day's been bad already. Three miles up on our left was our safe area where we would go to not get shot at anymore. And I thought, let's just get there. Let's just, and I just kept pushing the pedal. Let's go, let's go, let's go. With that being said, we are driving. And my buddy, Curtis, who was riding right here, Dan, keep in mind, was here, who had taken my position in the gun. Curtis was to my right. And I remember Curtis saying, I think, if I remember, he said, almost home. I can't be sure if that's what he said, but it was something, and it caught my attention. And I looked to him, and the minute I looked to him, everything went black. And I remember going, I, am, I, am I here? Am I, dr- I, what is, I was very confused. I couldn't, I couldn't make anything of anything, but I kept feeling bumping. What I didn't know is that we just hit an IED roadside bomb that sent a 15,000 pound truck airborne like it was a toy. And as we came down, uh, the, the explosion had shifted the motor inside of the truck and taken out all steering column and taken out all braking and just destroyed the whole front of this truck. And as I tried to gasp for air because the smoke was so thick and the heat, I couldn't breathe, I was choking, I kept trying to wave off. I look over and Curtis is screaming but I can't hear him. I can see you screaming. I should hear that, but I can't see it. All of a sudden, I, I'm, I'm trying to get some air, and I can't see anything. And I go to open my door, but the door was no longer there. It was gone. In this up-armored truck, no, every square inch had holes in it where hot molten metal from the bomb pierced into and through the truck. At which point, I realized we have a pretty significant problem. I hear some popping in the background, not knowing that that popping is actually the enemy still engaging us, trying to finish us off. The reality hit me that we're still in the fight. And, and you think, you have a lot of thoughts, man. I thought of home, I thought of my kids, I thought, and I started weeping at one point because I was going to die here and didn't ever think of that happening. And so, I had to gather myself to get back in the fight, to engage. We were still in the fight. And if anything I knew how to do, for those who knew me, <laughs> I knew how to fight. <laughs> so I re-engaged with the enemy, but I realized that there's a problem. I looked down, there's teeth in my lap. And I immediately got horrified. I thought, oh my God, my mouth is gone. And I start feeling, and all my teeth are there, and I was really confused. But then I look up and see the blood around the turret, and Dan's no longer there, and I realize it's his teeth. And in my shock, I thought, they can fix it. They can, it'll be okay. So there's teeth, and I put them in my pocket thinking, they can fix them, they can fix Dan. Then I realized there's an immense pressure, and, and we're getting shot at, and I'm trying to get out of the truck, but I can't move. Things aren't working right. So, you know, you, you feel something. You go, what is, what's going on? What's it? You like them socks, by the way? I know, ADHD, man. I had to show them the socks. You know, some people saw that, and they're like, what? Anyways, so I lift my leg to see, but... Unfortunately, when I lift my leg, there was only a, about a three-inch piece of bone that kind of come up. And I quickly realized I had just possibly become an amputee from this war. I cannot explain to you any other greater detail. There are other details, and I'll keep it PG-13. They don't matter. And I cannot explain to you any other further detail of the emotions or the thoughts that you'll have in that situation. I then began my rehabilitation phase where I was medevaced <clears throat> to uh, Tent City Hospital is really what it was, where they just started doing plug-in-the-hole surgeries. Uh, the chaos was there because I was not the only injured that day. We had had some others, and I'm in this hospital, this tent. They're pulling these guys in. Young guys burnt, head, degree, uh, head to toe, burnt, third-degree burn. He's just falling apart, literally. 
Another guy's triple amputee there. Again, I'll try to keep it PG-13 for the kids in the room. There's more detail. It doesn't matter. But imagine those sights and sounds. And then the fear of, I'm in their company. And so I really started struggling with some stuff where then I was uh, sent to Longstuhl, Germany, where they continued multiple surgeries. At one point, telling me I was going there, going to go ahead and finish amputating the leg. It was just too bad to save. But then there was another doctor who had another idea, and they sent me to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, which at that point, uh, and I will say this because it adds to the psychological part of it, uh, you know, we took off in that airplane to come across to the seas. We all left as patients on an air ambulance from Germany. We landed in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, where they removed the dead soldiers that didn't make the flight one by one with a flag draped over them. That'll play with your mind a little bit. We all took off together, but we all landed together, not all alive. So I'm building a case here so that you can try to feel and understand the psychological, physical, emotional of something like this. So short, shorter version of that, now as I go to Tampa, Blast Injury Ward, where I'm stuck in an injury ward where if you can imagine, I know this is crazy, I had a problem stuttering for the longest time. I'd call my mother, can't talk to her, she'd blah, 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 and she would just talk me through it, or at times she'd hang up and say, Matthew, just call me back when you can. I had to go through neurological retraining because the blast had caused traumatic brain injury. Um, which I spent playing 23 months of total time rehabilitation. And along that road of rehabilitation, especially in the blast injury ward, I met a lot of friends, uh, missing parts, burnt bodies. One guy had half a skull, shrapnel hit him right here, took half his brain out, and he was a child the rest of his life. His parents were taking care of him. I say this because there's a sacrifice, and the, the title of my message today is Honoring Sacrifice. Okay? Let me switch gears very quickly. Um, I got a buddy, his name's Marco Miller. Great dude, man. He was stud. This guy, he would walk in a room and he would know his presence, man. I mean, I was always a go-getter, but on my best day, I probably wouldn't mess with him well, from a distance in a rock or something, but that's about it. Uh, but Marco was just a massive man, just a stud. He's dead. Marco's dead. He didn't make it through it. He was also blown up and wounded severely, uh, where he took a piece of shrapnel to the base of his spine, severing all his nervous system. They medevaced him, kept him along, alive long enough to get him to Germany, where then they flew in his mother and his family so that they could say their last goodbyes before they pulled the plug, because this man would never speak or walk or do anything again. He would lay in a bed with his eyes closed. That's not life, so they chose to pull the plug. I found out about Marco later because I was in my own rehabilitation in and out of surgeries. And when I kind of came to and uh, one of my buddies in the Army thought it was time, he let me know Marco was gone. That hit me pretty hard. I would love to tell you guys that when I came out of my rehabilitation, that I did it the right way. That I, that I did it with honor and integrity. I did not. I did not. Now, there was a lot of other things going on in my life outside of the military that are uh, added to it, but we don't have time for that, and that's not the story for today. But I will tell you this. There was a lot of weight on my shoulders, and I cracked under the weight because I didn't have a good foundation. I started drinking, self-medicating, and it was easy to justify because the Army would give me the pills for free, and they never monitored how many it takes. So I just ate those things like candy. Stayed high all the time. You know... I kind of had to come to a revelation of truth at one point where I realized that Marco didn't have the same ability that I have to continue a life. And as a veteran who served with Marco with distinction, he is a very highly decorated man, as all of our teams were. He served with distinction and how was I serving him in his sacrifice in life? It was a very realistic and hard realization to come to for me because I imagined Marco standing next to me and watching how I was living and being very disappointed because I was a much stronger person than that. But I wasn't doing what I had to do. You know, that reminds me of a scripture. Go ahead and put it up there. You guys are great, man. You're so quick. 
We know this one, John 15, 13, but I bet you never read it the same once you see it through a certain lens. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You know, I would charge you guys, if, if you could feel the desperation, hear the desperation, get connected. Can you connect with this story of what I'm telling you? I mean, I don't mind if you holler at me. Can you connect? Can you feel it? Has it left you with a little bit of ouch, a little bit of reality? Good, because that's what I wanted. Because when I read this, it has a great meaning to me. But let me tell you something. Marco did not lay down his life for anyone. Neither did any other veteran that's been killed. We all fought. And we didn't fight to lay our life down. We fought to live. Some of us just didn't get the chance. There's only one person that has ever laid their life down. Who was that? Jesus Christ. That is the only person that has laid their life down. Everyone else has fought for it. So although I can honor that sacrifice, how much more, and I need you guys to feel the weight of this because I'm about to challenge you here with, my story is your story. My story is your story of the spirit realm. You guys are in the same fight that me and Marco were in. You're in the good fight of faith. We're called to be something. And I ran for years, ran for years, and most of you know that. But you know, eventually, thank God he doesn't give up on us. Amen? That is the same fight that you guys are in right now, the spiritual fight, the good fight of faith. Because you know what? I'm going to challenge you guys today, okay? The, uh, what I want you to see is the correlation here. If Marco was standing next to me, what would he say? Well, I will honor Marco's sacrifice, but I will not honor his sacrifice more than I will Jesus Christ who laid his life down. And every one of us in this room should be able to go, let, what, what would Jesus say? What would he think about how I'm living my life? What am I doing with it? See, unfortunately, too many people, it's very easy for people to connect with tragedy, but you, you don't ever see them connecting with the same passion and vision. They, people can connect with the tragedy of salvation and the cross, but then they totally forget about the vision. See, I could connect with the tragedy of what happened to me and Marco, and I could have stayed there the rest of my life, been a drunk, ineffective, doing nothing. Or I could have caught a hold of a vision and learned to be bold and use it to be something that will strengthen me. How much more should we be doing that as believers? Let's not stay at the cross. Let's honor the sacrifice of what he did in laying his life down so that we can continue. Amen? I, I, I tell people often, I love this statement, I tell people often, when you look in the mirror, are you doing what God's called you to do? I know I wasn't for a long time. When you do start serving God, is the vision that God's given you for your life that you're walking out greater than just you? Does it affect you? But then does it affect others? That's why I bring up Tom, honestly, not to honor any man because we honor God, but his vision went beyond him. And it affected others. And then in turn has affected others. I have a young man right now in my company. It's just like me and you were, man, this guy. I love him with a bonehead. I love him. <laughs> but I challenge you today, and that's what I want to leave here on the table with you guys today is a challenge. And what I'm going to do, Tab, would you come, please? What I want to do is challenge you guys to uh, look in the mirror of the word. Look in the mirror of the word and say, am I fighting the good fight of faith? Because here's the, here's the problem, guys. If... if your relationship with God becomes a religion that you're just checking the box. Why are we doing anything? At that, why are we showing up? If, if you're just coming to church on Sunday to say, I did my church, then why are we doing anything? Let me tell you this. You should be, now don't get me wrong, show up for church. Because I'm telling you what, between church, that's where you're going to get the building up 
uh, and the information and the feeling of the word. Church, small groups. I know you guys do small groups. I'm telling you right now, there is no excuse you could say to me or anyone else that's uh, got any level of spiritual maturity to say, well, anything in life is more important than being part of my church and my small group. This is where you build relationships. This is where you get empowered. This is where you grow. This is where you get the word written on your heart so that when pressures come, you can respond as the word says respond, not crumble and go, I don't know what to do. I crumbled because I didn't have the word written on my heart, but I changed that because I knew Marco would be absolutely disappointed the way I was living, and I dang sure knew Jesus was too. And I was sick and tired of being a disappointment, and I was. No more. And it was a hard road back, and a lot of you people who know me go, yeah, no doubt, what? I mean, I don't even dress this way, normally. But what I want to do here today is I want to challenge you. If you're here today and you could connect and feel what I was saying, but you don't have that same connection and feeling towards the sacrifice the Lord Jesus laid on the cross for us to live, if it's not as real to you what he did for us as it is about you could envision this story that I've told you, if we go from here today and all you do is go, man, I went to church today and heard this veteran that went through, through some great stuff, boy, he's a hero, we've done nothing. There's no hero. I didn't lay my life down. I didn't even try to. Marco didn't. Jesus did. If, I, if you leave here today and that's it, I've been a motivational speaker and that's it. We've done nothing. But through this, if you could say, you know, maybe I've backslid a little bit, or maybe not even backslid, but maybe, you know, my vision's not bigger than just me and my family. Or maybe, you know, God has been putting on my heart to go deeper. How do you go deeper? Get in the Word, man. Be studiers. James 1.22 says, be not only hearers of the Word, but be doers as well. I had other scriptures, but... There goes one. You guys are good. But it's irrelevant. This is where God wants to go with this one. If that's you and you say, I've got more. I want more. There's got to be less of me and more of you. If that's you on any one of those levels, put your hand up. Make a bold confession. I'm putting my hand up with you. Because I'm telling you right now, I'm a, let me tell you, God's very clear. He says, if you deny me, before man, I will deny you before Christ. I have never asked anyone to put your head down and close your eyes so that people could blah, blah, blah. Listen, they're lying anyways. They're looking, including me. We're lying. And I'm not going to ask people to hide themselves from seeing some of the greatest things in the world, which is people making a commitment and being bold. God's looking for bold people. So if that's you, put your hand back up. Uh, put your hand up. Let's make a confession. Say, that's me. I want more. I want to go deeper. And listen, guys, this is not because, oh, the veteran, the war, this and that, and thanks for service. But there's people out there that have done far, and mo far, far more than any of us. It has nothing to do with the military. Have been through family tragedies, whatever else the case may be, that you've got to go, I'm going to make a decision to honor a sacrifice. How do you do it? Thank you. You can put your hands down. How do you do it? You get in the Word. You study the Word. You learn the Word. You write it on your heart. You become a doer of the Word. And you walk it out daily. And you walk in righteousness and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. I believe today. Thank you. Come on. Let's give God a hand. Come on. Let's give God a hand. If you can't tell, I'll get jacked up about Jesus. I'm okay with that. I mean, I was just as bold about doing everything else I wasn't supposed to do. I better be bold about this. Amen? I truly believe a simple act as much as putting your hand in the air is enough to God, for God to go, I see you. You're making a public confession. That is an outward move of an inward change. I believe I believe that wholeheartedly. Those of you that said, I can do that and I want more. I want to come back to Jesus and live right. I want to get deeper with him. I want to, know, I want to be a disciple of the word. He'll honor that today. And don't let the, the, the devil who is a liar, he's a thief that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Don't ever let him lie to you and say you didn't get something. He's a liar. 
When that thought comes, you just say, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm moving forward. Honor the sacrifice that we have given life because of. Amen? It has truly been my honor to come talk to you guys here this weekend at Highland Park Church. I am humbled greatly to be able to be on this stage. Pastor Mike, would you come? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. They're just thanking God for using your life, man. That's Amen. awesome, dude. And That's awesome. Hey, As am I. who would have thought that? Not me. But, but God saw it, man. Right. But Amen. God saw it. My mom. God saw it. Yeah, your mom. She knew. Okay, so here's, here's how I want to close out of service. Um, is on the count of three, I just, I want you to say your name on the count of three and just hang with me. One, two, three, go. Matt. One more time. Matt. Now repeat these, these words after me. You just said your name, and now repeat these words. Jesus died for you. Mike, Jesus died for you. Dave, Jesus died for you. Ed, Jesus died for you. Steve, Jesus died for you. Craig, Jesus died for you. Shelly, Jesus died for you. Matt, Jesus died for you. And around and around and around, dog, Jesus died for you. We could go around the room. He laid his life down for you. And now we have the distinguished ability, Chad. Jesus died for you. Your sweet girls. He loved them so much, he laid his life down so that they could live. Now we get the distinct honor of going and telling others where life is found. Let's do that in the power of the one who saved us, whose spirit lives in us in Jesus' name. Lord God, thank you for Matthew and Tabitha. Uh, thanks that Aaron came with them. Thanks for blessing us. Thank you for letting us be with them. I pray you keep them safe uh, on their way back to Florida. I pray that you would use their lives and ministry back there as you continue to minister here. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.